There's an interesting quote uh, from somebody, actually I think it was Margaret I was listening to on a, on a YouTube clip and she was last speaking at our club about five years ago. Um, and she said, music is one of those ways we make sense of our lives. If you look in the, if you look on the news, music tends to sit in entertainment, but it's actually much more than that. Uh, it builds into our connection. I know if anybody comes to my house, they'll find musical instruments littered around the house. And most people here have that same connection with music. Um, they say if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. But I don't know many professions that where what you love requires as much hard work, travel, training, disappointment, um, and highs as well as the life of a professional singer at the highest level of opera, oratorio, and recitals. Uh, Dr. Margaret Medlin, ONZM, is one of our most successful exports as a singer. Uh, performed across Europe, the UK, Australia, um, National Opera, Covent Garden, Vienna State Opera, and she's even lifted the cultural levels of Australia, which is a hard thing to do. Um, as impressive as this is, she's her um, position as head of voice classical at the New Zealand School of Music. Passing on those lessons that she's learned is probably more impressive. Uh, I think that ability to uh, be a fairly tough taskmaster, as I understand, to her students and passing on that work ethic that needs to go with the uh, taking the knocks as a professional singer. Uh, and as an outcome of her doctorate, she's uh, last year published her book, Embodying a Voice, Singing Verdi, Singing Wagner. Uh, and that's looking at how the singers take their own creative agency uh, to co-create works with the composer. Please welcome Dr. Margaret Medlin. Thank you, Jerry. Yes. Oops. A life on the stage, resilience and grit. I might add to Jeff that I knew I was home and hosed when the Australians claimed me as their own. <laughs> I made a few pertinent comments down there. Now, you'd think that, you know, a nice, I'm not Kiwi, I'm Cornish, a nice Cornish girl like me, um, you know, she was quite cute, wasn't she? But how on earth did she get to be a monster like this? And that stage blood, obviously, and that not a real head, but actually uh, Rodney McCann, who was here before you, and some of you were uh, here before me last week, some of you will, re will remember that he was John the Baptist for the, um, the Zalame we did in, the, in the, the New Zealand Fest of the Arts. I can't remember what year that was, except I was the page. Um, so going back, so... Going back to that little girl, I mean, it's sort of, that picture slightly worries me because there's a sort of a manic grin on that face, which sort of indicates some sort of obsessive nature. And uh, as we know, um, people who are classical singers, as Jess, Jeff alluded to, have to be some sort of obsessive compulsive. In fact, Sting has owned up to that. And you have to be prepared to put in an awful lot of work, an awful lot of grit, and an awful, have an awful lot of resilience. And in some ways, in, in fact always possibly, that was embedded in me as a child. Um, we're going to go past the blood and gore to my grandparents. The, these, they are the starring roles in Chu Chin Chow in the 1920s. And they were bohemians and artisans. Grandpa used to move from country to country doing all sorts of work. I mean, he did some really interesting thing. He was working with A.V. Rose as he developed the Avro Jets. So he wasn't, uh, he could fix anything, he could do anything. But they ended up emigrating to New Zealand after my parents in 63, we came in, Helen and I came in 1961, and the reason my parents came to New Zealand is because my mother was fed up of being caught, of doing her musical work and being put in the blue collar party at the end of the show. So my mother, who, who's here, had a lovely voice. 
and she was accepted into the Royal College of Music just as the war broke out and of course it closed down and she was then uh, put on the land and became a land girl and of course naturally had a lifelong, lifelong love affair with cheese which was to the detriment of her figure. They came to New Zealand, they um, my mother said uh, my, they were terrible, terrible business people, as I suppose um, you lot aren't, but they were artisans. The artists had no idea how to manage money. But my mother said the, the greatest thing, apart from meeting a house on the way to work at 5.30 in the morning in Hawara on Dad's first day of work, was the wages, the money on the Friday. And that was very important to them, and they felt New Zealand was an amazing place to come to. You worked hard, and you got just rewards for that work. It wasn't to do with which class you were um, put in or set in, whether you were white collar or blue collar. And I think I've had that sort of renegade attitude ever since, both Helen and I have. So then Mum came, we went to Auckland, Mum continued her stage career in plays and she developed the Playhouse Theatre in Glen Eden. And um, Helen and I, my sister, younger sister and I were um, inveigled, uh, forced, bribed to be at the theatre all the time and we grew, I was on the stage, we were both on the stage at five dancing, we had to play the piano, we had to prompt, we had to paint scenery, we had to make costumes, the only thing I didn't do was lighting. Uh, which is a shame because I could do with that knowledge now. So, you know, and we just had to make do. I think I tried to escape from this life because just before, just after the picture, the little girl picture was taken, I had an eye operation and I conceived of a very urgent desire to become a medical doctor. That sustained, sustained me all the way through school. Uh, I was determined to be different to my family and my sister and so I was brilliant at sciences and uh, I still did music on the side, got great marks. Boys were a problem because they sort of, it was difficult to be smarter than the boys, but you know, I sort of got there. And then of course I went to university and suddenly I was subsumed into choir and I had this ridiculous desire to become a singer. No one, because my parents were uneducated, said, hang on a minute, you've wanted to be a doctor since you were five. No, it was just music or bust. And so, Mum and Dad, we all went to rehearsal, and poor Dad, who had no musical watch training whatsoever, is a lovely, quiet man, was inveigled into Mum's shows. And here he is, Lee loved dressing up, and he was the, he's the, the Mikado, I think, on the right, and a pirate in the Pirates of Penzance. And so we all used to go, we used to have a convoy, a first, last, furthest person away had to drop everyone else to rehearsal. And that taught me about being prepared, getting knowing my music, getting everything going while doing my schoolwork and having all these rehearsals on the side, but also being different. We didn't have a television. We read a lot. Um, so, you know, we were slightly, I realise now, quite weird for people at that time, unless, unless you guys are probably the same age as me. So you might have been weird too. Um, oops, oh, now what have I done, Patrick? Okay, so my, I went to New Ze um, Auckland University, had a, did a degree in music. I had a bit of anthropology and English on the side. I forego my pre-med year and uh, promptly escaped New Zealand as quickly as I could. And I ended up in the UK and got a job with a lovely Kent Opera. And I had the degree that I and my colleague Jenny Wallerman and I have developed up at Vic is nothing like the incredibly useless training I had at Victoria at Auckland University. Um, so, I, but fortunately, I had the training of my family because I was asked to. I did a sort of evening class, and someone said, "Oh, can you audition tomorrow for a chorus position?" I did in Marylebone Road. They gave it to me on the spot and said, "Can you turn up at rehearsal tomorrow? Here's the music. Memorize it overnight." which I did, learned it. And I, the trouble was I had to dance at the same time. That was a bit of a problem. That took me another day. But the first, that first opera, you know, I rem I'm, everyone else had been rehearsing for three or four weeks, so I sort of sucked it up, put a bit of grit in there and put the good face on it and thought, sort your left foot out from your right, Margaret, prickly, and got on with it. Uh, the, the opera on the left-hand side is I was in Il Seraglio by Mozart, and the problem about that was the Yashmak 
because you can't see anything through a yashmak when you have it on stage. So that was interesting. The picture in the middle when we were all browned up was oh, both pictures when I was, we had to change from pirates, from natives to pirates in one minute on the side of the stage. So you quickly lose your any sense of modesty that you have. Uh, what's more, the costume in the middle was made of enlarged dishcloth uh, with um, sewn on leaves and at the end of the tour those leaves were at a premium because they kept dropping off. So I had this little industry going of, because I can sew, I was making these nice little leaves to sort of hock off to people, which would quite easily pay for a bed and breakfast. Uh, yeah, so that, that, all of that was very interesting and sort of the, re, the real life of having to learn music quickly and be prepared. At the same time, as I mentioned to some students just recently who were grizzling about their small roles, I was understudying roles and my first line ever on stage was, your bath is ready, madam. And that was it. I had to wait for the whole opera to sing that. <coughs> I actually made a film with Rodney in it with that. Okay, then I moved on to small roles. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, and the one on the left is Carmen with our wonderful Richard Greger. And Richard Greger and I, Richard Greger gave up singing last year, but suddenly was decided he wanted to sing again uh, on the condition that I sang a recital with him. And that's happening on Wednesday at St Andrew's Church at 12.15. So he's, he, it's very good for Richard to sing. I, I mean, I could do without singing at the moment. I'm too busy. But it's to keep Richard singing, and he, it's going to be wonderful. So he was Don Jose, I was Carmen, and we had a wonderful Alfa Romeo on the, on the stage. Uh, I have a feeling Rodney was in that too. Then I was, uh, just these little roles building up my experience. I was with Malvina, Dame Malvina Major, I was Carabino, and then I was the, in the Zalome, when Rodney again was John the Baptist, I was the page of this very complicated stage. So when you do a stage performance, we're at this stage now, we've learnt the music, we've done the basic um, blocking of shows, but now next week we go into the theatre and that means hanging around and hanging around for ages and 1% doing it, hanging around while the creatives get their act together, the lighting gets right, the costume gets right, and it's, you just have to stick it out really. Although I have to say when I did Kacha Kabanova two years ago and I was at the end of a 12 hour day on the side of the stage in Auckland, I said to someone I knew in the chorus, I said, next time remind me that I'm just gonna buy a ticket to watch the show. I was in high heels, wig, tight suit, and Spanx. Um, so, New Zealand, building up my little career, and then I want to talk about risk, because suddenly, out of the blue, I was in my late 30s, someone from Australia rang up and said, do you know Azzacane O'Neill Trovatore? And I went, uh, no. They said, could you learn it? And I said, um, I'll ring you back in two minutes. I looked at the score and thought, oh, yeah. It was pretty easy because I can read, read music, read the piano. Rang the boat and said, yeah, I can do it. They said, good, can you come over next, um, on Friday because they need you on the, in, the, in the rehearsal. And I'm going, oh, whoops, what did I just say? Anyway, a friend of mine from the UK was here. He came up the next morning. I'd learned it overnight. And he said, yeah, yeah, you'll be fine so long as you don't actually do it. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay, fine. And... I got there, all the other people, these people, I, I'm the one on the left with the scarf, were people who were sing, singing at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, and I sort of watched it. I was a little alarmed that the tenor, Richard Marchison, as I walked into the studio said, oh, thank God you come, we really need you. <laughs> and I went, oh. <laughs> Anyway, I realised that there was a lo lovely lady who actually couldn't sing it, so I went home and furiously memorised, and they put me on. They asked me, and I said yes, they put me on on the public dress rehearsal. Now, this is seat-of-the-pants stuff. I'd never had a stage rehearsal. I just thought, well, Margaret Medlin, you just got to suck it up and grit your teeth. And I'm the, I was the smallest person on stage, and I'm not small myself, and these were... These, these were tall and wide people with very loud voices. And I remember going, 
oh my God, Mark, you've got to pull something out of the bag here. And I did, and I, I, I mean, it was a great experience, and from then on, my career in Verdi started. And um, I, that was very interesting, I quite liked singing Verdi, it's all very pretty and it's nice, but it was never, I really liked, preferred singing baddies. You know, it's all very nice being a goody, but, you know, the baddies get to do the interesting things. And, um, you know, obviously, in another life, I was a real baddie. And um, a friend, a very lovely colleague of mine, Elizabeth Cannell, sadly passed away, used to say that if she didn't work on the stage singing all the baddie roles, she would probably be in a psychiatric lunatic asylum. And sometimes I feel a little like that, that all my sort of inner urges are enacted on stage. Um, and some of them are pretty vile. Anyway, so that's uh, as uh, Amneris, who is pretty sort of manipulative to two different times. And then I was uh, given the opportunity to sing in the first ring cycle in the Southern Hemisphere with a wonderful cast, also with the wonderful Sir Geoffrey Tate, and um, they basically taught me, um, I've, I think I've now sung eight roles in Die Valkyra, but I also did a lot of other roles, and again I had to understudy something at very short notice. Uh, I, while I was there, English National Opera asked me to sing two roles, so I had to learn those, and Talk about hard work. There was no, apart from the wine tasting in Adelaide, it was all hard work. Uh, and then finally, after that investment, I call that an investment in the, my work and also the German language, I was asked back to sing Kundry. Now, this production was, um, as you can see, the hair is pretty massive. So that required me going into makeup. So you usually make up two hours before the show, it's a long opera, so that's a five o'clock start. Um, so I'd have to be there, at, I'd have a huge lunch, be at makeup at one o'clock. They do the hair, they do the makeup. By that stage I was hungry, so I'd have to work out what I could eat and not be full of meat and veg. Um, and then just stick it out. And the 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 producer knew I was quite fit, I was able to do anything. I ended up, at, no kidding, bruises. Every, every bit of flesh you can't see was covered in bruises because I would roll, they would be put, it was very interesting production, it was very athletic. Um, very grateful. We opened that production two days after 9-11 and that's been one of my, what the sing, we singers call Sternstunden, star hours. I'm standing on the stage at the end of that, uh, tears rolling down our face. It was all about gender and race re re reconciliation. It was an amazing experience. And um, just a wonderful colleagues to work with. So I did my Verdi and Wagner and then um, uh, going back to Zalame, I did lots of Zalames, um, interesting productions, qu uh, quite often last minute ones. And I began to think, um, I was getting on a bit then, and what else was I going to do? I was getting a bit bored, because you know, singing is all about the Zalame, you do one show a week, and what you hang around and spend money in some city, waiting for one show a week. Well, I. I realise now I was terminally bored. I tried painting, but that took too much energy, and I should have been doing my academic work. You know, when I came back here, I, I've always taught, and the head of school at the time said, I'll oh, come and do some teaching here. And I realised how much I enjoyed teaching and giving back and sharing the lessons that I have learnt from a life on the stage. The life on the stage is... Uh, stage sorts you out because you have to address a lot of problems about yourself. You have to address how you look, how you feel, how you act. You have to take criticism constantly and process it uh, in a way that's positive to you. And people who can't take criticism and grow and develop from that go down the gurgler very, very quickly. And that's a big problem I have with students, talking to them about how to address that. Anyway, so the big, the big um, is, lesson I learned in Zalame is that I don't like intervals, I like singing all the time, I don't like hanging around. Um, so I just like to get on and do it. 
Um, sadly, if you get to be an old bag like me, the old bag rolls are usually quite short. That's quite good because you get on and get off and you get out of the costume. So then I got my job at university and I started teaching and then I, I was a bit annoyed. I mean, it's very kind of Jeff to say all these nice words about me, but I got very annoyed at university, begging the pardon of various university people who are here, um, that people thought I was a diva and I've got this job of head of, a vo head of voice and I was a flake. You know, I was just a performer on the stage. I wasn't an academic, a flake, and I thought, I'll show you. So my head of school kindly said I did a Doctor of Musical Arts, and I went, not on you, Nelly, I'm going to write a PhD. Well, I loved it, and I should have done it years and years ago. And what's happened about that is that I was in a car with Simon O'Neill, my friend Simon O'Neill, and he was brassed off because some critic had criticised his appearance and singing. And I said, Simon, they don't know how hard it is, so I'll write about it, and I did. And so the consequence of that, I did the doctorate with this title and the book was published at the end of the year. And it's, uh, it's also, it's a course book, but it's also for people who love opera singing and sort of go, well, what's the fuss about? You know, it can't be that hard to get up and sing and, um, you know, sing a few songs and things like that. No, it is the hard, second hardest job in the world because they did some research. Brain surgeon is the first. The second one is being an opera singer. They've done a whole lot of research. So bear that in mind. Am I running over time? Oh my God, I'll hurry up. Okay, so, so teaching is wonderful. And now we're putting on these wonderful operas, Swore Angelica and Jenny Skiki. And well, the reason why we're doing is that for the first time, I think, ever, usually we have 30 sopranos, no, no tenor, and hardly a baritone. We suddenly had all these men, and we, and, you know, we usually go around the world trying every opera. We went, we could do Janny Skiki and Swear Angelica. Sad, funny. We're doing it in the Hannah, which is a small environment. We've got a cut-down orchestra for small, younger voices. Um, I'm doing the old bag because I didn't want a, a young woman singing the old bag. And my colleague Robert Tucker <laughs> is singing Johnny Skiki. Well, I watched the runs on Friday, and, and of course I'm in the run on Saturday. It was fabulous. It was so funny that it's really, really hard work for these students. And I've had to remind them: you, you have to keep on going. This, you think this is hard doing the music all together, wait until next week when you're waiting around for lighting people. So it's an ongoing process, but I assure you, I'm very, very proud of them. And um, as I said, one's a tragedy, one's a comedy, it was written at the end of the First World War. It's about sharing our domestic common humanity. Maybe um, convents aren't in most of our spheres of interest, but certainly people arguing about wills are. And uh, the shenanigans that people get up to is very funny. So please come and see these wonderful students, which is, we're playing, and me, and me, um, Friday the 19th and Saturday the 20th at 7.30 at the Hannah Playhouse, and Sunday the 21st a matinee, 2.30, because you'll be amazed at these students. They're beautiful. They're, they get it all right, they're energetic, they're enthusiastic, they're committed. And I think that's the experience, that's the experience that I wish uh, that I had had at university, that I have had on stage, supportive. We're giving them constant feedback, telling them how to process that. And as a performer with them, I'm enjoying it as much as I hope they are. So please come and support them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yours is. Here right. we go. Am I staying? Or going? You're staying in. Okay, you stay there. Jeff comes up. Now, we're a little short of time for questions, folks, but if you'd like to chat to Margaret afterwards, please do. Right. Just a couple of little notes from that, Margaret. And, um, isn't it interesting that when you started off thinking about being a doctor, you became one just not yes. quite where you expected? <laughs> Don't tell um, me your problems, Jeff. One of the things I thought about that is, wouldn't we all like to go back and build the degree or qualification that wish we wish we'd had to get to where we wanted to go? And that's what you're getting to do. Um, I think one of the things that struck me is there's a lot of waiting around, learning to live with boredom, balanced with fear and exhilaration, uh, and how to take criticism, which I think is probably a, a generational thing that we all grew up probably taking more criticism when we grew up, 
than perhaps kids do today. So I think getting that resilience built into there. Um, so I think you got where you uh, aimed, but not necessarily where you expected. No. So uh, please join me in, in thanking Margaret again for just more time for <laughs>